our international viewers from the East West Center in Honolulu. I'm Susan Kreifels, and I manage the East West Center's diverse media programs. We are very excited to offer our first EWC Seminars Live this year. EWC Seminars Live is a series of virtual panels designed for multinational journalists and informed audiences that focus on news and media issues. In 2023, we plan to offer these programs every two months. Today, 200 viewers have signed up to hear senior journalists speak on a topic that remains very important to both the East-West Center and to viewers around the world, the state of media in Myanmar. This is our third panel focused on Myanmar media since the coup a little over two years ago. The East-West Center has more than 140 media alumni in Myanmar. Some have left the country, some remain. We continue to be very concerned about all of them as Myanmar has become one of the world's most dangerous places for journalists. Our diverse panel of distinguished journalists today includes national, international, ethnic, and freelance Myanmar journalists. Media throughout the region face increasing challenges, attacks on the free press, economic stability, safety, disinformation, and challenges to women in media. We look forward to examining these issues in future EWC seminars live panels and inviting panelists from such esteemed organizations as the Myanmar Women Journalist Society, a national platform of women journalists committed to protecting and defending women journalists' rights. Before we get started, I would like to quickly go over today's Zoom protocols. This program will last 90 minutes. About halfway through, we will turn the program over to questions from the audience. We will start with comments from the panelists and questions from the moderator, then turn to audience questions. To ask a question, write in the Q&A tab and specify which panelists you would like to answer the question if you have a preference. The panelists will answer your questions live. Please start to send your questions as soon as possible so they will be lined up before we turn to Q&A. Also, please visit our website, www.eastwestcenter.org slash seminars for more information about our diverse journalism programs. The East West Center offers eight to 10 journalism programs a year. Finally, I would like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Kevin Woods, East West Center Research Fellow. Dr. Woods specializes in political ecology and human geography with a focus on land and natural resources, ethnic-based armed conflict, and rebel governance. His geographic fo focus is in mainland Southeast Asia, especially Myanmar, where he has worked in varying capacities for nearly two decades. Thanks to Dr. Woods and our distinguished panels, panelists for joining us today. And I'll hand the program over to you, Dr. Woods. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan, for that introduction and, um, and opening remarks. Um, what an honor uh, to moderate uh, this panel today. Um, I am not a journalist myself, uh, as Susan made clear. Um, but um, over the years of working in the country, you know, Burmese journalists uh, firmly secured a special place in my heart. Um, as many of you know who are joining us, uh, Burmese journalists have been at the front lines of pushing and fighting for democracy, for human rights, accountability, transparency, to make um, a better and more inclusive Myanmar for everyone in what is a, a very diverse country. Um, in my own work engagements um, in Myanmar on environmental justice uh, issues, I have relied over the years on countless journalists uh, in Yangon, in Mandalay, in provincial capitals and ethnic states to help inform the Burmese public on issues of corruption, illegality, and other abuses of power in the natural resource sectors, for example. And I'm forever indebted, and they have played such an important role to get those messages out. Um, and they do all of this work um, despite the risks. Um, as Susan mentioned, uh, Myanmar is the second biggest jailer of journalists in the world after China. Um, this is serious stuff. 
Uh, the country's conditions following the coup certainly present new challenges and risks to doing their, their job, which we would, I'm sure, all agree is now more crucial than ever. But the coup um, also forces journalists to constantly test new innovative ways to thwart the return of these uh, draconian measures so they can continue to shine light on what is indeed a very, a very dark time. And through these crucial commitments, spreading hope and the possibility for justice for a new Myanmar. Um, and, and that is why we're here today. We want to hear from them on how they are doing this. Um, so without further ado, um, I am so honored and pleased to introduce to our audience our four esteemed panelists of exceptional Burmese journalists who represent diverse backgrounds, types of media organizations, and topics and geographies covered. From Rakhine State to Shan State, from international to national to ethnic media organizations, the panelists today will speak on the different challenges they overcome and opportunities they have found in the reporting since the coup. So if I may, I'd like to start um, with Somia, who I'm sure many of you already know. Um, he is co-founder and editor-in-chief for the very respected and beloved Mizuma Media Group. Uh, he is an award-winning Burmese journalist who has worked in the media field since the early 1990s in various capacities. Um, also currently uh, serves as chairperson for the Media Development Committee of Burma News International. He was uh, the 2022 Greeley Peace Scholar at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and the recipient of our very own East West Center 2022 Journalist of Courage and Impact Award. And I will like to add that um, I have relied on Mizima for getting my Myanmar news since I started in 2002 and was also uh, where I placed my first op-ed in 2006. So thank you. <laughs> um, so Mian, we're very happy to, to have you back with us today. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Shung Nang, um, who despite being only in her late 20s, I hope it's okay to say that, um, and I will add navigating what is a very dominant, a uh, male dominant field, is a Pulitzer winning senior correspondent currently leading the Myanmar reporting team for Reuters. Um, exceptional. Her and her team have covered a variety of topics, including such tiny things like the Rohingya crisis, the 2021 general election, the coup, the ongoing civil war and the pandemic. I mean, uh, incredible. Um, such hard hitting topics in just the past few years. Um, for example, in 2018, she contributed to Myanmar Burning, which is a series uh, on the expulsion of the Rohingya from Myanmar, which won, uh, because of its excellent hard-hitting reporting, won several awards, including the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting, Bravo, um, and the Farfield Prize for Investigative Reporting. Um, before joining uh, Reuters, Shunang worked at the Myanmar Times, uh, an excellent uh, uh, at that time, an excellent uh, media outlet, um, as well as freelance for several other international media outlets. So Shun Nine, thank you so much for joining, and I look forward to learning from your insights today. Um, next, uh, Sai Kampu, who is currently CEO at Sean Herald Agency for News, uh, also Sean, all capitals. Um, Sean is a Sean news outlet that I have known and followed for many years, especially their coverage on the uh, drugs economy in Sean State. Very appreciative for that. Uh, he's a graduate of Chiang Mai University's Regional Center for um, Social Science and Sustainable Development, or RCSD, which is a program that is exceptional and I know very well, uh, particularly for their uh, critical education on environment and development that is so needed uh, for coverage in Myanmar media, if I may say so. Um, prior to being CEO at Sean, Sai Kampu uh, worked as a research manager and uh, conducted field work on the illicit drugs economy and war, which are uh, very important uh, issues to Sean State. And in addition, he has also co-authored several um, papers on Sean youth migration and entrepreneurship in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So Sai, um, thanks uh, for joining us and it's really good to see you again. 
our fourth, but certainly not least, especially because he's an in-house East-West Center Ohana, is uh, uh, Jocelyn Lang. Jocelyn Lang is a well-known independent journalist from Rakhine State. He's currently an EWC-affiliated student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, majoring in Asian studies. He has authored dozens of articles on human rights, political transition, uh, transitions, and issues related to the Civil War and the military coup, um, all of which have appeared in many leading international publications. Uh, and I will say, despite his young age and his humble beginnings. So Zhao Sang Lang, welcome. So now that we're all acquainted, um, I um, invite each panelist um, in the order in which I just introduced you, starting with Seya Somia, to give their opening remarks, where I ask um, that each of you highlight your kind of key takeaway points about Myanmar media since the coup that you, that you want to put out there right away. I just ask that you keep this to five minutes or less, please. So, um, Somia, please uh, lead us uh, on the opening um, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, EWC uh, and colleagues, and also who, those of uh, friends and colleagues who are joining to this discussion. One, uh, uh, I uh, spoke with the media on 8 February 2021. That was a week after the coup in two years ago. Uh, I stress that our work is to report in whatever situation and uh, we will find new ways to do our job. You know, that is exactly what we have done over the last two years. We found new ways to do our job better than even before. We are fighting every day for freedom of expression and the survival of independent media in the country. Uh, media, independent media, when we talk of independent media, it is a very diverse uh, uh, outlets, including national, ethnic media, regional media, which have been playing a tremendous important role in the media uh, struggle and struggle for freedom and democracy. And also media personnel, particularly women uh, here, I would like to stress that who are working in the areas controlled by the Honda and who are also working in the conflict areas are putting their own lives and not only their own lives, but those of their families just to do their professional job. Many of them with little support, not enough support, and in some cases, even no support at all from external actors. Those of our colleagues who are in the border areas of the country, for example, Thailand or India, or even Bangladesh, they have been also struggling to continue their work within whatever the space they have. Of course, you know, it is once twice, and we voluntarily take up this fight for the media freedom for the last more than 25 years. And uh, I am convinced that we will continue to find better solution oriented ways, creative ways for strengthening our work and for establishing a better society. One military stage coup on 1st February 2021 Basically, the independent media in the country was supposed to be disappearing, supposed to disappear. At the time of the coup, people asked if Myanmar's independent media could survive. They wonder how the Myanmar population would react to another era of military rule. I believe today, after two years, uh, after two years of the coup, the Myanmar people have answered these questions loudly and clearly. The independent media in the country have not only survived the coup, we now see audience numbers far higher than anything before the coup, with a strengthened network of operations across the country. I just would like to take away three points of the recent uh, findings of a national media survey conducted by an international organization in the country. One, what they found is, despite shrinking space for independent media and barriers imposed on assessing news in Myanmar after the military coup, there is still sustained access to news from independent media outlets of the country. Second, they also found out that audience interest in and demand on news are high, and they have managed to bypass technical barriers and even take risk 
to keep following news. They also found that in spite of restricted access to media platforms, for example, Facebook, communities from the countries, states and regions with conflict areas are most active in seeking news since information is critical for them to cope with security risk from ongoing conflicts. We are very much encouraged with these findings and we will continue to serve our audience and readers better in future. I'd like to stop here. Thank you um, so much, Saya, for, for those points. And I mean, not only surviving, but also thriving. And I think those, those three points that you stress illustrate that uh, so well. So thank you for those, those remarks. I would um, next like uh, to invite Chun Nang to um, give uh, some of her key messages to us today. Thank you, Kevin. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for having me here and listen to, listen to our stories. So unlike, um, unlike also me, I'm more of like a new generation journalist who haven't experienced the previous like coup or previous regime. So uh, it was very nice to hear from Usami and his experience about the situation. And for me, I became a journalist because of the 2015 general election where NLD won the landslide. That's when I like really started the working. And then I um, started working at a local newspaper and then joined writers and that's that's basically the journey. So when the coup happened, this is like pretty new for me. And um, despite all the um, novels I read or despite all the stories I heard from senior journalists, this is like really um, like overwhelming, I have to say. And as a and then so many of the journalists struggle in so many different ways to get the information out of the country um, um, and the coup. And many journalists have no choice but have to leave their leave the country. And some are still very bravely remaining inside the country to get the information out. And also, I would like to add that so many citizen journalists have like emerged in like this very critical situation, and then they are the key of us like in having the information. So as a journalist working, as a journalist, I'm working for an international news agency. Um, I need to really stress on the fact that I need to rely so much, international news agency needs to rely so much on the local media outlets. And because of all the human resource, a lack of human resource, like I cannot reach as much as local media outlets, especially regional media outlets, like ethnic media outlets or uh, other regions, small media outlets that are based in southern region and specialized in regions. So um, we hugely rely on them. And so I, I would like to talk about the, uh, the welfare of the journalists, especially the journalists, the working journalists working on the ground and their struggles. So we all know how important the information is and how to get this information out of the country. And but then we also need to take care of the sources of our information, which is basically these citizen journalists and working journalists on the ground. And their lives are not so great. I mean, yes, we have found so many creative ways to do our job and we also found some uh, creative techniques and we can report so much, but then um, our uh, the daily struggles of these journalists are really um, breathtaking. It just, um, like they don't have the, uh, for, for the design journalists working from the neighboring countries, um, they don't have the legality status, they don't have the proper health insurance, or they don't, their children cannot go to school. So these are the sacrifices these people take, um, make to in order to get the information out. And also those journalists working inside, still inside the country, even in like a city like Yango, where Uta has been causing so much pressure on and so many checkpoints and everything, um, they put their life at risk in covering all the information and putting it out there as much as they can. So um, we need uh, that. I would like to work on, on the uh, trust on the fact that we need to take care of these people and their welfare, their well-being, and they uh, make sure that their children go to school and they uh, they can visit the clinics and so and basically uh, so that we will have more quality news and more um, informed stories from the journalists. Thank you so much, Shung Nang. Um, I especially appreciated hearing your origin story. Um, 
And I, I just think it's so important um, on stressing these dynamics between those who are um, outside the country or working for international media versus those who remain inside the country, and especially those who are, um, you know, either freelancing or citizen journalists, and um, really having to very seriously take into account their welfare and well being, and especially following the do no harm principle. So, um, thank you so much for raising those issues with your, your platform. Um, so next, um, if I may, I would like to turn to Sai Kampu to give us some remarks. Hey, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Susan, and um, it best center for inviting me uh, to be, you know, uh, talk uh, to talk in this very high uh, respect uh, um, panel discussions. And I'm really I feel honored to you know be able to speak here because of you know uh, I can't you know make the uh, marginalized voice to be heard and yeah as as a from for me as a from the ethnic media, um, you know I would like to give you a bit background of the Shan. You know Shan was formed you know, uh, and affiliated with the ethnic uh, liberation organizations. Or, you know, but it became the independent independent media in uh, afterward or in 1991. Uh, you know, and the Xi'an also based in exile, and during the transition, Xi'an also uh, returned to uh, Myanmar and you know, uh, to live with the people and work with the people. And our freedom and enjoyment and could be a short lived, you know, until the coup and you know the COVID that uh, during the coup, you know, Myanmar is a is a poor and you know uh, poor healthcare and poor health system, and you know the health system is below standard and standard, and it was really impact on the uh, people and you know, but. You know, Myanmar is just like, a, you know, as you know, it's a, a rich natural resources country, but it's like a curse, you know, people did, uh, have not enjoying the benefit, you know, um, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the people not get benefits and really impact on the people. Uh, to lead the coup, the uh, Myanmar people really face in difficulty, but the, uh, the coup makes people get things uh, more uh, suffering because of, you know, all the crisis, you know, uh, financial crisis, economic and so on. And as you know, the Myanmar just is really weak and, you know, uh, under the coup, millions of people are unemployed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when people have no incomes and so it's uh, the life, uh, you know, really in difficult, as you can see the daily report that, you know, uh, you know, the burglars, uh, burglars or muggers or thief, you know, on a daily basis, you know, the increasing of crimes. And, you know, uh, the, we, we could say that, you know, the rogue regime or dictators, you know, broke everything of, you know, the country, let's say the future of the uh, young generations and also uh, the, you know, um, uh, people are really uh, in really uh, bad situation. And so, you know, uh, if we uh, look at that, uh, the, Myanmar, you know, after the coup has become a quite no rule of law. And if you live at the, uh, you know, if some people are, you know, steal of your property, but you cannot complain to a, a police or uh, uh, no, uh, to the authority. And you know, the country, as we can say, there's no rule of law and it's a, become a failed state because of you cannot rely on any uh, one for security. And so um, the as you can see, I would like to bring you to look at the Shan State. Shan State is one of the largest states in, in Myanmar, but also the major ethnic armed group also based in Shan State. So, you know, our media is quite, you know, uh, work you know, in the Shan State quite have many challenges, not only the Demodor, but also the ethnic armed group that based in Shan State. And also when we do the, uh, you know, the uh, reporting on the ground and, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, our reporter because of the, powerful group, I mean, those, you know, the armed group or the mother, know where about our, our, our journalists. And we have to deal uh, case by case and many cases that, you know, when our journalists have been, you know, intimidated or, or you know, sometimes detained for a short time and they have to deal all the, uh, you know, all those cases. And uh, I think um, our, you know, role as a media, we have play our role, uh, reporting on the ground, what happening and, you know, uh, you know, torture, killing, arrest, and massacre, and so on. I think my point I would like to raise here is that, you know, the media report, uh, uh, reporter or journalist, we play our role reporting on the ground every day, you know, the incident, the torture, the killing. But I would like to, you know, uh, you know uh, request the international communities to support, you know, Myanmar, or especially the CSO, uh, to do a documentation, you know, because 
generalists, we don't have that kind of technical. But you know, any organization, institution that you know can support our documentation uh, for further reference to to bring the dictator or perpetrators for accountable. And that uh, I I would like to to raise uh, my 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 first remark. Thank you so much uh, for those comments, Kampu. Um, I think you know it's especially valuable um, the role that ethnic media organizations uh, play in the country, and and Sean uh, is uh, one very good example of that. Um, to be on the ground to raise the type of very complex issues, uh, such as what your news organization covers in Sean State. Um, so we're we're very happy to have you here. Um, I next uh, will turn to our um, our uh, final panelist, uh, Jocelyn Lang. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you very much for all people uh, especially watching today. Yes, yeah, almost my senior journalist, Gosomia Gosai Machuan, already talked about the very you know harsh situation that Palmer generally today we are facing. And um, yeah, so as you, as I think uh, almost people will be very familiar with the Rakhine State. Uh, the Rakhine State, like, you know, even during the NLD government, uh, it's really uh, hard to get in, even, you know, the, especially the international journalists, uh, they are, are not allowed to assess and also enter the Rakhine State. Yeah, today, yeah, even today in Rakhine State, especially I, I have two points after the coup. Uh, most only in Rakhine State, three media outlets are business, the local media. So the military know who are they, <laughs> who are this and who are working, how many people are in the media outlet. And also they don't have other, other speed to go and to move. And I just remember uh, on the day of school, almost three, almost, you know, two weeks, local media, development media group, they still working. And also they, all the media workers are hiding. And I am called the phone. And so why, you know, happened? Because they, they really worrying about to check, uh, the, you know, to be arrested by military because they, all, they are med, um, media editor in chief uh go on men who were you know under char with uh 505 and so many things even yeah last week the military threat and also one the rakhine local media uh not to support their movement also the 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 military restriction over the street and also the the military yeah, the, the the military also uh the one the issue or the media, you know, the editor in chief uh calling phone and I was talking, you have to store such things and you can you know, be arrested. And also we will definitely do that. So this is the way they are doing threat uh, to threat the media, not only Rakhine, but also you know, anywhere in Burma, in Myanmar. And also we, you know, our uh yeah our guest speakers Kosomias and Kosai also really mentioned about that how you know journalists are facing um yeah so I myself uh, I work as a freelance journalist it's really hard to set uh you know local voices I almost based on uh, I almost you know I relied on the local media uh their publication and also their uh you know relief information also talking with that you know if i know something if i have to verify some you know some i'm sure things so only depends on you know my sole reliance on local media um so it's really hard uh after and also right now i'm just in living in yeah so honolulu this you know to our time also you know like a wrong close like 6 a.m and 6 a.m 6 2 a.m just something so i just first almost uh, I think when I can hear there, I want to get here first time. I just remember I couldn't sleep uh, because of this, you know, wrong close situation. But I really appreciate almost journalists who are working on the ground and right now who are living in, you know, Mesar, Chiang Mai, Bangkok. They are really brave and also they are working so hard. So I'm not every day following their media outlet. And so I really want to encourage the you know in the international community to support local media and also ethnic media 
and all the Myanmar national media. So we all need information that leave our society to be free and, and also fear from the free. We all, we, you know, are also it's maybe only, uh, uh, I think, you know, supporting the local medias and national medias, maybe uh, only the, the people, uh, you know, make points longer. So we, yeah, the international community really need to support. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you, Jocelyn Lang, for those um, for those opening comments. Um, you know, and you know, noted the the intense uh, surveillance and scrutiny of those uh, local journalists who remain in Rakhine State, and um, how, but how crucial of a role they uh, continue to play, especially for those who are now based in safer uh, contexts. Um, um, you know, I, I have to say, like, I, I just really appreciated and loved the solidarity expressed uh, amongst our panelists for your colleagues, especially those who are more marginalized, um, either geographically uh, or otherwise, in terms of reporting. Um, I found that uh, extremely inspirational. Um, in terms of, um, you know, showcasing that it's not it's not just this inside outside dynamic or I work for, for an international outlet and, and another person works for a national. I mean, like everyone really seems to be reliant on each other to get the news out and keep people safe. Um, that was a really wonderful message that I found um, kind of uh, common across uh, your topics. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I hope others, the audience also noted that. Um, Okay, um, I would like to now transition to uh, kind of the next segment uh, of, of our time together today um, by for the next 20 minutes um, or so, um, having a discussion that I, I uh, hope to moderate um, with the panelists based on three prepared questions. Um, and I, uh, uh, for each question that I'll ask, then, um, each panelist in turn will give their answer. Um, it's one to two minutes each. Please keep in that mind, that's kind of hard to do uh, because otherwise we can, we just like don't have enough time to get to the audience uh, questions. And I'm sure they're, they're flying in with questions already. Um, and if you haven't asked your question yet, uh, audience members, um, I wanna remind you to uh, go ahead and put that in the Q&A box because after we're done with these three questions, then uh, all of you have the floor for the rest of the time. Okay, so um, how have you and your media organization um, innovatively adapted to reporting since the coup? And how has the way that you report and what you report on um, differed or not um, from past periods of military rule? Because obviously this is not the first time. I would like to start um, with Somian, if I may. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Burmese people have uh, risen up and taken the fight to the military uh, junta. Uh, in many ways. Uh, for media, uh, many of us scattered ourselves in different locations. Before COP, we are based in such and such area, the Yango, Nebido, Molemiai, Pa'an, in uh, locations, such locations. But after COP, we knew that there will be a crackdown uh, and the crackdown came and we scatter ourselves in different areas. So which is first very important uh, that we did. And where they, these areas, these areas, a lot, many of these areas are already not controlled by the junta, uh, controlled and administered by the ethnic minority groups who have been also fighting for their own uh, autonomy and self-determination for decades. So they shelter the Burmese media and media personnel, whatever limitations they have in their areas. Second, some of them over a period of time scatter or move to a border areas, which is a kind of a safer area, not safe area, but safer area. And we are very happy and uh, to see that there are about 100 Myanmar media groups operating in Thailand alone nowadays. 
So that is one. And of course, even uh, in there are also areas which are more and more not controlled by the hunter. Even by the, according to the international organizations, we can say that half of the country's territories in Myanmar are not controlled by the hunter. So more and more liberated areas, quote unquote, liberated areas are coming up in the country and Myanmar media and media personnel are operating in this very difficult and challenging uh, environment situation. The challenges is, of course, safety, safety wherever you work, uh, either in the uh, areas controlled uh, uh, by the junta or in the conflict areas, there are bombings and airstrikes and uh, going on in many of these places. So safety is the most challenges that we, we are facing. So I will just stop here. Um, thank you uh, so much for that. Um, I, if I may, I just want to comment on how remarkable it is um, and such a change from, from the near past with the reliance of safety in um, ethnic, uh, uh, well, I'll use the word EAO, ERO uh, territories and the governance, the non-government ethnic governance systems that are operating there. That's quite a remarkable new political uh, arrangement that's happening. Um, uh, I would like to uh, next turn, if I may, to um, Shunang. Okay. So yeah, also just like you mentioned, and also you guys are already familiar with, we have come, uh, we have come to adapt to the fact that we are now remotely reporting on Myanmar. So after after the coup, and I left the country, and now I'm based in Thailand. So I rem and I try to go as much as I could to the borderline area and etc. But then so there's a restriction and limit. So for the all the information. Um, I get that through the, I get that, as I previously mentioned, relying on the citizen journalists working on the ground. And then also according to the, some of the sources that I have built over the past five years working as a journalist, and these sources are still working inside the country, they are working in different sectors in the country, so um, they have, they heavily trust me and I share their information, and then we have been gathering like remotely. And the fact that Onka has been like um, unreasonably and unpredictably um, um, present on the media outlets and media workers um, really like um, caused the struggles and problems for us in terms of verifying the information, verifying the news and everything. And but also there are people like who really rise in the, in the difficult situations, like these people were so brave and they uh, bravely answer all our questions to us. Then for example, like these villagers who live in this certain village when on top of, they, despite their physical threats and everything, they still like, they know the importance of talking to the media outlets. So when we reach out to them, they were so like, um, they were so helpful. And then you, I cannot believe like how they are also well organized in terms of like, okay, they know down like how many houses as in and how many people were killed. And then they know that they need to send this information out to the journalists to the wall. So um, that that's really like the thing that really surprised me. And also just like the point you mentioned before, like all the media workers, we kind of have become like working together in this reporting this current situation. And like all the journalists like very easily sharing all the information each other, sharing the contacts and sources. And every people who are not journalists are also very willful, willingly helping us. And without those people help, like we cannot report this situation. And even saying that, I don't think we can report like more than 50% of what is actually happening on the ground because of all the restrictions of the internet Cut, uh, as, um, cut off the access to internet, cut off the access to some phone lines, even in some certain regions. So uh, there's so much still going on on the ground and then so much fake news and misinformation are spreading out. And but the, the good thing can the camp out is that everybody is become more of like, um, more helping each other, willingly helping each other. And also even like um, villagers living in the remote area now have the knowledge that they need to note down this information and they need to share this like whenever journalists contact them. And despite they have these breaks that um, were physical, like really getting killed or getting arrested. Yeah. 
Thank you uh, for that. In the interest of time, I'm not going to touch on uh, the key points that I especially loved. Um, we're a bit over time, but I'd like to um, give the opportunity for Sai Kampu if you want to uh, say just a few words, but please uh, keep it a bit short, if you will. Okay. Um, you know, as a media um, organizations, and we would like to ensure everything will be okay for our journalists. But the situation is beyond our control with the given situations. And the journalists are very in difficult circumstances. And the Picari journalists are in dilemma in terms of securities. Living inside the countries is quite risk, you know, no, uh, no safe heaven for them. And, but you know, to relocate it and exile themselves is encounter the another risk. For example, like you know, in exile journalists, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, risk being to arrest and deported by the you know the, the foreign authority you know in in destination countries and so they have faced many challenges for example like in terms of documents and, and so on and yeah but this is the kind of yeah uh you know situation but however you know still to keep the news operation and going on we adapted you know with our you know, situation for example like uh you know the shan has the long time network and different occupation uh, occup occupations, um, you know, the people and uh, the religious, the businessmen and so on. But recently, the emerge of the CTA is quite helpful to run the newsroom. You know, the CTA across, uh, uh, you know, different township and they are very, you know, quite brave and they dare to take photo, videos and sending texts to the XI media. And they are quite really brave and, you know, doing their job over there. Thank you. Um, a lot of similar messages um, amongst the panelists. And uh, I'm so sorry, Jocelyn Lang, but I, I really kind of um, need to move on to the next question, but there's uh, so many other opportunities for you to stress your points moving forward. So I, I apologize. Um, and just so uh, to mix things up for the next question, I'm gonna do a different order uh, of, of the, our panelists. Um, so the, the next question is, um, you know, I would be, and our audience, I'm sure, is really interested to learn more about um, any challenges. I know we just talked about challenges, but any challenge you've had to overcome in reporting since or even before the coup with regards to or based on your own identity or which region you re report on or from where you were reporting from um, or, you know, based on your respective readership of, of your um, media outlet. Um, so I, I would like to you to think a bit more about your own um, positionality or where you're covering um, in terms of maybe some specific issues that you've had to innovate to, uh, to overcome or other challenges that you, that you wanna discuss. Um, Shunan, can I start with you this time? Yes, yes, Cha. So um, actually I have like this perfect example story like that I recently published. So um, recently I published a story about how women political prisoners in smoke, uh, sit inside our mentally over prison were beaten by this group of male prisoners. So um, as I work on the story, so th this a couple of notes like smuggle out from the prison to the outside. And that's how we know like what happened in there, like basically the whole issue. So <coughs> regarding that the story, the only um the only source I have are like all the end name sources because of all the security reasons and uh, situation and also only this like make a note that this handwritten notes by the women political prisoners. So and then I need to confess to my editors and like my lawyers working and my my own organization lawyers that this is like um credible or this is like very fine. And I need to talk to several, several sources uh, across the town, like in Mendeley. I need to check and check on the, um, uh, and like, um, and name prison staffs and prison uh, authorities who are still working. And then finally come up with like what I have and what I know with what happened there. And then that one, and like in supporting on this story, and I need to like, highlight on the point that what I don't know as well. Like writers cannot independently verify this situation. Writers cannot, uh, were not there to witness this situation. And then although despite contacting to the on-task spokesman for several times, it, they, they didn't respond to writers. This kind of points I need to highlight. 
and but then um, it is all, all like working with the working with the look at civil society groups and also look at activists who are briefly very brief enough to share us and also the stories from the parents of these political prisoners who also despite their really extremely bricks they share their story and also I need to find a way like to hide their identity in my story not to cause more trust on them not to cause more pressure on them and um, basically, even if they spoke in the situation, they, that will reveal their identity. I need to hide that those facts as well, um, so that they won't be under the trust by their own term. And it is, I mean, I just, I can't, I just can't get enough of thanking these like local activists uh, working in the in mentally for helping me out with the story. And I mean, this is just an example. Like for every other story, for example, like government. Um, hundreds of houses were burned down in a southern village in Sakai. Then I need to work on like um, with the ground sources as well. So the difference before and now is like now I need to take longer time and more verification to confirm a certain fact. And before maybe I would be able to work on a story for like break it's just a breaking news here in the world story for like one day, but now I need to take the whole week because I need to serve a check again and again and again to professionally present this is corrupt. So, and then also to convince my editors and my lawyers that everything's very fine where they check like, you know, you guys or, or you guys know like how they check each point, each point. So, but these are all the good process. Yeah. I wanted to hear from others as well, yeah. Um, thanks. That it's especially helpful to hear of a of a recent concrete uh, example that uh, you have had to work on. So thanks for that, um, Jocelyn Lang. I'd like to turn to you since you didn't have a chance last time, and I just ask that we keep our responses to one minute. <laughs> oh, sorry. What's this question? Sorry. Oh, Jock, come <laughs> on. Um, <laughs> I, um, I want to hear about how your own, either your identity, where, you re, where you're from, where you report on, um, how that um, matters in terms of the types of challenges um, that you need to overcome. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so so basically, yeah, so for, I'm from the Rakhine State. So, so before the military coup in, in February 2021, I covered the Rakhine conflict between the Army and the Myanmar military. Um, so at the time, I was not, I was, you know, very no much problems reporting, talking because I really had, you know, good connection with the people from, especially Rakhine ethnic Rakhine people. Uh, as being, I also like, you know ethnic Rakhine. So it's really easy to talk, you know, I can use my own language. And, uh, but I, so the problem is what I encounter with the Rohingya people. So first they, they, they really like, you know, they don't, they don't trust me and they don't want to talk, but I, I never forced to talk with me. And, uh, and also I thought, uh, this is like, you know, we have, you know, remain in the inside, you know, the personal identity, ethnic background, and uh, this remain make uh, is their feeling I'm safe talking with the people. Uh, because I think uh, we also have, you know, long-term distrust each other. This may be really hard to, you know, get, uh, uh, that's why. Uh, so first all the time I have to talk with about, you know, I'm from the Rakhine, so I'm working journalist, you know, so mostly I work in human rights or just something talk about almost 15 minutes sometimes, maybe five minutes around talking about background and yeah, it's just building trust. Yeah, such a thing, yeah, it stay remained. And especially the things like, you know, very crucial, like, you know, the previously happening, like a massacre, you know, a group of people we are killing by military at the time. It's really hard to verify and talking to, to people because the military can listen uh, through the phone call as well. So they, they are also uh, wait, uh, wait, they are also just, you know, uh, the worrying about talking through phone, uh, through phone anyone. Is the it, at the time it's not the first and personal identity use or background or generally because they suspect everyone should be you know related to, you know somehow with the military or something. It's really hard to verify such as you know a group of like uh, such as like you know a huge violation by military. So they really worry in their feeling. They they feel really worried about to be arrested and to be killed 
you know, like a third person by military again. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, so we're behind on time, but here's here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make an executive decision here. Um, I really want to give Sai Kampu a chance uh, to answer this question because I, I suspect it's important to him. Um, and then I'm going to eliminate the third question because I suspect our audience is getting very antsy and wants to start answering their questions. And uh, so Mia, of course, I, I mean no disrespect, um, but I, I'm gonna just keep it at uh, Sai Kampu and then we're gonna go to the audience. Thanks for understanding. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And I'm gonna make it really short and you know, uh, the challenges and how we overcome all the challenges. And there are many challenges. And for example, like, you know, after the coups, because of the securities and, you know, the people or some sources, and uh, they don't be part of to being in the views. That is the challenges, you know, we encounter. And, but we have to look more, you know, different, source, uh, to different sources. Yeah. And also the challenges also, you know, after the coup, because we could see, we could see and hear that in Myanmar and Burma, the depressive news happen every day, torture, killing, massacre, and so on. You know, this kind of depressive is really in the long term gonna impact on the mental health of the people and the journalists who are dealing up the situation in themselves. But, you know, and uh, the challenges and, you know, we concerned and how to prevent our journalists not to be mentally or, you know, trauma impacted by those given situation. And those are the challenges, but you know, still have to you know, find a solution and how to prevent this. You know, uh, this is I wanted to 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 to, to rest. Wonderful. Um, thank you, panelists, for enduring those two questions and and for giving us insight in into that. Um, I, I want to uh, turn to the audience. We're really excited to hear from them and be able to um, converse with our panelists. Um, so that's what we'll be doing until the end of our program. Um, I want to start with the first question, which is actually about ASEAN. Don't we love ASEAN when we talk about Myanmar? So um, the question is, um, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to attribute the questions to a specific audience member um, uh, throughout all of the questions. Um, and this is to everyone uh, who would like to answer. So ASEAN has been largely impotent, that's the audience member's word, in trying to work with the military junta to make the situation better on all levels in Myanmar. Um, that's the their opinion. What are, given that, what are the next steps that can be done from the regional partners to affect positive change in Myanmar? Would anyone like to um, jump into that? Kevin, can I see? Of course, please, Somia. Uh, unity. I think uh, uh, as Myanmar's struggle for democracy, federalism needs unity and united movement, ASEAN also needs uh, unity. ASEAN needs to be united. Right now, we are seeing divisions within ASEAN, uh, individually and groupings. And ASEAN, that is one. Second one, uh, united ASEAN on the principles and on the five point consensus that they have decided needs to work with the regional partners and international partners. I think uh, that is one uh, of the points, uh, uh, especially UN uh, Special MY uh, on Myanmar just made uh, 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 the point uh, yesterday at the General Assembly. The, so that because Myanmar situation is very complex, long, 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 historic, and we need united uh, stand. Uh, we know that everything we cannot agree, but we need to work together. That is what ASEAN also needs to uh, act on its own five point consensus. Yeah, can I just? So I'm, I'm sorry, I know like there's a time limit, but I just want to add like a slightly small point. <laughs> Go for it, please. So like just just like um Usumi said like we need United Stance and and it has been quite a long while since ASEAN came up with this fight consensus which obviously have not been working for the past year military hasn't been slowing down its violence military has even more like escalating the um escalating their offenses attacks in Sakai across the country in Karini in Karen so please this is not working out so um really need to come up with more strict 
And then uh, Onha has been manipulating everyone, saying like they have their own five ro five point roadmaps that they are following, which is completely different from five consensus of ASEAN. So um, Onha has not been like uh, cooperating with ASEAN that much. And some ASEAN countries have been really strongly standing standing on the relations side, but then um, some others like need to like step forward and like join them. Wonderful messages. Thank you for adding that, Chung Nang. Um, and unless uh, there's any other comments, I can go to the next question. Um, uh, this one is particularly for uh, Goso Mie and Gosai, um, because the question is about um, independent media. Um, what are the main challenges um, that independent media um, is facing to just survive at this very critical moment? That is a wonderful question. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so I mean, you can go ahead. Yeah, Kusai, please go first. Um, okay, um, as I said, you know, the there are many challenges, you know, after the coup, and but you know, the main challenges could be, you know, the security of the journalists, and but you know, we have to find the way or you know, solution or adaptation. Adaptation is the best way to survive, not the strongest one, but adaptations are uh, skill. And you know, we have been adapted, you know, uh, we train the local journalists to provide uh, you know uh, information sending photo video and so on uh, you know some you know uh, uh, journalist space in exile and doing the you know the final uh, news productions and publishing on, on on yeah but yeah I think in this uh, critical and so I think uh, because we don't know and how long the coup gonna last and you know how many years but you know the media have to prepare themselves uh, to be able to keep a running and operating news production, whether you know, based along the border in exile, and this is, uh, you know, the the uh, you know the, the way of the solution or adaptations. Uh, for me and for uh, for me, uh, the challenge is basically to keep doing what we have been doing, and what we need to do as a journalist, as an independent media. As an independent media, we need to be impartial. We need to be balanced, we need to be factual, and we need to be professional. And that is the challenge in this kind of situation. How we can be, we can be uh, impartial, how we can be balanced, how we will verify our sources. Very difficult. Uh, in many cases, we cannot be everywhere in, where the, there is a bomb or there is a killing or there is a news. We cannot be. We, and the, there is also competition of the professionalism, school breaking news and how we will make sure that whatever the news we publish and broadcast are factual and professional and balanced. That is the challenge uh, one. Second one, the survival of the, uh, our work. We, uh, we, we, are, we are getting with gratitude and thanks support from international community, the financial support in the last two years, particularly after coup. And, but that support, financial support is dwindling down because the world attention and the crisis in ukraine is there very much we are sympathetic to the people of ukraine for their fight for freedom but the international community also has to cut down and reduce the support and we don't have to be honest we don't have enough support financially from the international community and of course we don't also have a, a business revenues all these business revenues are lost uh, were lost with the military coup. So that is also second challenge. Third challenge, lastly, the technical challenges. We need a lot of, because Myanmar military junta is working closely with China, with Russia, in monitoring and surveying and people's phones. And you see all these scanners uh, 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 used in different parts. And Myanmar, and we need uh, internet, we need telephone. Uh, and in many areas, Myanmar junta cut the internet one to stop the free flow of information second to stop the work of the journalists and CSOs so we need such and that is the biggest challenge uh, one of the biggest challenges as well we need internet we wish uh, uh, we have a starlink like uh, what uh, was uh, given to Ukraine so that people in different parts of Myanmar have internet access free from the Myanmar military hunters control 
Those are great comments. And I hope our international community uh, specifically heard that there's a strong need for further support. Um, and I, I feel like Somia may have also anticipated the next question. And it's one that has already come up uh, a few times um, in our conversation together so far, but perhaps uh, one of the panelists would like to add further comment to this issue of verification um, in terms of what are the biggest challenges you're facing with verification? Um, how do you stay independent and impartial during a conflict without, uh, uh, without fear? I mean, um, I know many of you have already spoken to this, but perhaps uh, is, does anyone want to add anything further to that? If not, that's fine. We can go to the next question. Um, the audience person who, who uh, submitted that, thank you. And um, hopefully you, you heard the previous answers in terms of verification. So um, the next question, if I may, um, is someone who's referring or is speaking about India. Um, I get the sense that maybe they're there, although I, I can't verify that. Um, but it says in India, there is a near blackout of news from Myanmar, um, despite their long shared border and the, and the flow of refugees, especially since the coup. So is there any way independent media um, in India can amplify the work of independent media in Myanmar? I love that solidarity between India and Myanmar, which is ever so me needed since the coup? What a wonderful question. Um, who would like to start that? I, I, I don't want to come in, but uh, uh, my, my colleagues can answer very much. Uh, please do. Otherwise, I will have a short. One, because I use, I lived in India for more than 20 years before 2012 mm -hmm. as a refugee. And uh, I understand and I value the, the, the independent media in India. And they did, they do great job. And uh, for me, the solidarity is important. One of the reasons why we keep fighting, we can keep fighting is because of your solidarity, your support. We know that someone somewhere is supporting us, somewhere some, uh, uh, is with us. That's why we keep fighting. We are able to keep fighting. So please give how you can give support. Many examples. For example, we are currently organizing a Thai media trip to border areas with Myanmar and Thailand to see to show them what is how people are uh, living in the inside Myanmar or on the border areas. And uh, Myanmar military is currently undertaking serious airstrikes and offensive in many of these areas. We went. Uh, the Thai media uh, to see to and see with their own eyes and uh, uh, and just hear with their eyes so that they can report to the, back to their countries. That is what we would like Indian media to do, independent media in India to do, uh, so that our situations are highlighted and written in the Indian media. Just one, uh, UN Special Envoy yesterday uh, made a, at the assembly. Who, she made a remark that humanitarian needs are rising across Myanmar as a result. As of today, 70.6 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. More than 1.6 million are internally displaced and an estimated 55,000 civilian structures have been destroyed since February 2021. These are happening across your border between India and Myanmar as well, in Zagai region, in Chin state, in Magui region. Please help us report in your media on this situation and these facts and figures. That was very persuasive uh, and uh, really um, uh, encouraging remarks of how to increasingly build uh, that cross-border solidarity. Um, thank you for those remarks, Somia. Um, I, I have another question um, that I have a feeling that many of you are going to want to speak to, um, um, which is just like very simply, what is the current situation or, or story that is currently happening in Myanmar that you want to get more media attention and coverage on? That's a great question. Um, who would like to go first? Let me, let me go first. Yeah. So um, basically, what is the current situation happening in Myanmar? So 
um, fightings are happening between the UNTA forces and all the resistance forces across the country every day. And in Yangon, um, there are some um, not um, a peaceful, peaceful movements um, slowly happening, but despite um, because of all the um, pressure and all the arrest from the UNTA, which has been slowed down, these peaceful movements in like big cities like Yangon mentally have slowed down, but they are still happening. And um, the UNTA has According to my data, my reporting notes, and also the my my understanding from the local media outlets reportings, um, the, um, the UNTA has escalated their offensive attacks across the country, in Kirini, in Southern Shanxi, in Zagai, especially Zagai, and some hundred houses got burned down every other in a while. So these are all happening, and just like I previously mentioned that. I don't believe that we can cover more than half of what is actually happening on the ground. So we need to cover more, especially with uh, the region Sakai. So I myself find it very difficult for me to verify the information of what's happening in the Sakai. So there are so many tips like that come out um, of what is happening, but then a lack of resources because of the lack of resources and lack of time, like I cannot verify every single event. So we need to, I mean, I mean, it's not only about writers, it's about the whole media outlets landscape. So like we all need to like uh, verify as much as we can and report on those issues happening in like, as in like mass, mass killings, what well, villages more burning down, uh, which has become very, it is very, um, I'm very um, sad to see this, but it has not become like a new thing now, right now. Like if you hear about a village burned down, it's not a new thing right now. It has been happening for, why? If you hear about a group of people getting killed, it is not so new and new or so surprising anymore because it has happened um, more than like a dozen incidents in the past two, three months. So, but which I cannot verify every single single one. So that, that that's the that's the thing I want to highlight. Yeah, that's yeah, that's like uh, a bit uh, that's heavy, right? Like that should not become the norm. Um, and so that's that's very sad, but nonetheless, the dry season offensive is uh, well underway and atrocious, but not um, being covered to the extent that it should be. Um, so thanks for that, uh, Shunnang. Said Kampu, can you um, give some comments, please? Yeah, I would like to add and respond to the uh, question. And I think to get intention, and I I don't know what you know the uh, strategic the, the Myanmar people can can do. You know, the, right after the coup, the you know the peaceful demonstrator demanding the UN help. How many dead body you want that you will intervene in Myanmar? They asking for uh, P two P and so on. But you know, after two years, we could be witness that you know there are torture, killings, and massacres, and. Uh, Right now, till now, over uh, you know, six thousand people have been you know uh, killed, and over uh, ten thousand people uh, you know have been arrested and put in jail. But I think you know the uh, you know the CSO in Myanmar and also the media should work together, have a you know the uh, technical uh, you know a skill to document it, to you know document it of how you know the junta violated the Geneva. Conventions or international humanitarian law when they bombard the villages and also you know the uh, you know the non-combatant or civilian place school and uh, villages to document it and bring for the perpetrator to for accountable with the international available mechanisms. Yeah, I I, I think that would be uh, you know could be kind of the way out. Thanks, Gosai. Uh, Jocelyn Lang, do you want to take this chance to say anything? Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, thank you again, uh, very much, Mashu, and also Gosai. So they're really well talking about yeah, their experience, also what they're facing in Myanmar. Uh, I'm saying, I myself, I'm just looking at international media and reading to you. So they're really less covers. Like, you know, after one year later, so right now two years, they are really less covering about the Myanmar, what happening. So I feel like, uh, you know, something we really need to, you know, push on or just something, you know, you know, talk about international coverage as well. Uh, uh, I myself, I think, you know, the journalism is the first, you know, draft of the history. So we have to write and also we have to report that, you know, reflect for our, his, you know, history. Only right now, you know, only writing 
and things are you know can be fine you know in like maybe next 10 years or something so right now so like last two weeks uh last i mean last week you know, we, you know we can see like the sky uh the Elon Musk killing so but international media they less cover and just reading like you know uh maybe like investigation report or just something they really have to do but you know i feel like they really less covering about the such as event this that this is the most i feel like you know almost uh, at least 54 people we are key uh, and also including monks and also just a religious background the people so i think this is really uh, uh it's really need to document such a thing for like you know other I think another what I think is like, you know, after the reporting, the local media, so international media, the inter the international humanitarian group or the UN, they can get information and start collect the information. And also they can also easily verify the information. This is the most important things the international media all have to cover each of the bombers today, especially the war zone. The people are every day fleeing the country and dying, and also so not killing, you know, but dying in the dying in the main, like you know, uh, one like you know, cave, yeah, so many like you know, uh, like at the city. So it's really must, uh, uh, you know, covered by international media. So. This is the data what you know in uh, the Myanmar freezing, especially there's a lack of international media coverage. Thank you. Um great. That was uh that was wonderful to give you the chance to like here's the story that I want I want out there, at least on this webinar, if not in greater media coverage. So um uh, I'm glad that we had that chance. Um now we have a question on social media. Of, um, you know, this is you have to ask a question about social media. It's, it's just so important in this media scape, as you all know, especially in Myanmar. So the question is: is you know, what is the role of social media um, since the coup under military rule, and um, it's particularly how how is it interacting with or supporting the CDMs, the civil disobedience movement? Um, and, and, and what does this mean in terms of surveillance um, and like the military searching people's phones and like all of this stuff that has gotten very serious and very intense since the coup? Um, thank you for that question. And I look forward to see what our panelists have, uh, have to say. Who comes first? Sean? Oh, anyone? Okay. Anyone? So many, you're welcome to lead us okay. on this and have uh, other people uh, jump I will, in. I will have a few, few, few sentences. One, Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, social media, particularly Facebook, remains the uh, uh, one media platform or one uh, platform which uh, the people in the country uh, consume news and information most. Uh, in comparing with other media platforms, despite the fact that the, the junta uh, uh, banned uh, Facebook and uh, uh, put uh, repressive measures to stop uh, to uh, for the users to use uh, Facebook and social media, so that is a good uh, 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 sort of a, a platform uh, as a social media for getting news and uh, information. And for the CDMs, that uh, they also have to rely on partly, at least, uh, uh, even for for their survival and for their uh, uh, for the sub for receiving the support from their friends and colleagues around the world. So that is one. But uh, social media is also used. Uh, uh, extensively uh, by the military junta. Uh, we have a very well-known, uh, uh, infamous uh, telegram uh, under the name of Tui Tao, uh, which literally translate, if you translate, it is a blood sucker. Basically, that uh, telegram uh, post uh, publish the information about journalists, not only journalists, their families and basically attacking the, the media persons and their families and uh, asking to attack them or to arrest them or to torture them. That's how social media is used 
uh, by the Honda in that way as well. So social media uh, has uh, all these sites, but definitely still an important platform. That's why we need these social media platform owners uh, and uh, companies to be responsible uh, 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 in, in the country, in Myanmar particularly. Thank you. Um, yeah, Shunan, you wanna you wanna add yeah. something, please. Yeah, add something. So, like, yeah, Facebook has been very helpful in terms of like allowing the small media outlets. Uh, I mean, I don't mean small uh, media, uh, big media outlets like Misima or DV, but like they are also like some small media outlets. And then Facebook has been allowing them to publish the news and kind of like a main platform for the sharing things. But still, um, I think Facebook needs to relax some rules with the media outlets. For example, and sometimes um, these media outlets post the photos of the weapons or like the, some of the dead bodies, would let, but not exactly like in a horrific image, but the Facebook just came up like, especially with these weapons photos, like Facebook just like banned the account, which is actually the media outlet um, logo account. So um, it really slows down the information access and information like uh, spreading the information. So I, I, I particularly suggest I want to suggest like not, not only with the Facebook, but like social media platforms to become a relaxed uh, rules with the certifying media outlets. So like these media outlets are sharing the verified and correct information. So um, they can relax like those that rules a little bit, yeah. Thank you for that. The opportunities and the challenges that social media present um, in even normal times and and, and what a coup does in, in that context is very challenging, but important to um, carefully consider. So, so thanks for that. Um, the next question um, is, is provocative and important. Um, it's about hate crimes. Um, how have MIMA journalists covered hate crimes in the country, um, such as those based on race, ethnic identity, religion, such as, but not only the Rohingya, um, before as well as since the coup. And um, I want you to think about how, how this may change under future better political conditions. There's a lot of uh, ways uh, to, to answer this. And I think it's uh, really important given the history and severity of hate crimes in Myanmar. So I look forward to your responses. Thank you. Uh, I thank uh, uh, George, uh, Cherry and George uh, for uh, asking this very important question. Uh, personally, uh, I view that uh, Burmese people at large, including the leadership uh, uh, of whatever the sites are, and independent media at large have failed in Rohingya issue, uh, in fail in understanding and and reporting about the uh, uh, Rohingya issue. Uh, that was that is better now uh, a little bit in my opinion uh, uh, after 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 having gone through uh, uh, different phases and also uh, different. Uh, uh, tragedies, similar tragedies in different parts of the country. Uh, uh, for the for the five last five years, uh, the Rohingyas are persecuted and they remain stateless and in and out of the country and continue to suffer extreme hardships, living in difficult conditions and tremendous challenges. And we better do uh, uh, our job of reporting these sufferings uh, uh, and highlighting, continue to highlight these uh, uh, sufferings in the national media, in the ethnic, regional media, and international media. I think we need to do a better job. Yeah, I mean, in, in addition to what Usumi has said, so um, while I was covering, focusing the Rohingya issue in while living in Myanmar at the time, um, I experienced this like um, hate speech and um, harassment from the people and also even some fellow journalists and like um, accusing me of being biased 
uh, because I came from the same religion background or accuse me of bias because I work for the international media outlet, etc. But then since the coup, um, those people have come to me and like they have apologized and they have like apologized for their accusations and people have actually like changed. I can see that like they publicly even apologized to some to the ranger by posting on Facebook saying like oh, um, we, are, we are really sorry that we didn't um, understand what was happening over there and then now we have come to more understanding and then um, they promised like they will not make the same mistake again not only with the Rohingya but with every other like ethnic groups or or the operation of the UNTA. People have come to this enlightenment enlightenment of UNTA being not discriminating any ethnic ethnic in terms of like oppressing them. So uh they 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 realize that and then I I I'm a very positive person. I see the positive change and then I I I believe that this will be, be a there will be a positive change in the newer federal Myanmar Union. Um, Shung Nang, I especially appreciate your response to that. Um, I'm sure it's been cha challenging navigating that space. Um, so thank you for those thoughts. Um, Gosai or Cho Sang Lai, do you want to say anything? Or I have another question I can move to. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah please. Um, mm -hmm. In case of Rohingyas and uh, because of you know the Shan doesn't cover and but I would like to just uh, give example in from the Chinese context and about how the Shan media uh, media play our role and you know in uh, term of hate speech and but we don't you know promote or in you know if anything store or a story but that could be inside the any tension we, uh, we try to avoid that you know but however we you know Shan media we also uh, you know try to you know like a respect diversity of you know like uh, um, the chance like people and yeah great um thank you for that um so um i have a a few lingering questions that are kind of fragments of what audience members have asked and also other questions that i've had in my pocket uh to throw out so I, I would like to take that opportunity to kind of um, speak to something that has been raised previously um, which is you know solidarity and support for journalists who are more marginalized whether because of uh, their gender ethnic identity geography of where they're reporting from or what they're reporting on so I, I'd like to continue in that vein and particularly uh, bring up the struggles of uh, women journalists um, and uh, how, you know, how has the coup condition, um, you know, changed the situation for them and their reporting? If I may, yes. Um, so like, um, I have been living in Thailand right now. And then, um, it, it, as just like also Usumi have mentioned previously before, that many media workers are now residing in the neighboring countries, including Thailand. And I travel up and down across the country and meet with as many journalists as possible I can and also my sources as much as I can. And then it is very sad to know like so many horrible, horrible things happening on the ground. Like for women journalists, they have like this special different needs because of their, they are not only women journalists, they are also mothers, they are also daughters. And then they need to take care of their children and whom, which I previously mentioned, like whom don't have access to education because they are they don't have a legal status living in a neighboring country, but then um, they don't have access to the clinic for pregnant women journalists when they want to give birth because they are illegally residing in neighboring countries in the borderline. So these are the real struggles that we are having. And um, also the abuse and the harassment on the women journalist comes not only from the outside, but also from the within. And it is um, very sad to say it's, uh, in, inside the media houses, the abuses and the harassments are happening. And these women journalists are, um, are hugely relying on their work, like they are media, own, media houses, because now they, are, they cannot go back to Myanmar for now. And they have been exposed to, the, to and their names and their faces are exposed because of the work they do. And so they cannot go back to Myanmar. And the only survival and the only reliance they have is their job, uh, which is the working at the local media outlet. And if they are senior, like abuse them, they cannot really like 
oppose against them or they cannot really like defend themselves because this is their only single threat life for the survival of not only her own but also her children in some cases. So um, so there's some this is, um I, I I do have like my own uh data and also data that I. Uh, uh, um, was supported by the media development organizations. If you, if any of you like, would like to hear more, I can like individually speak to you guys and feel free to reach out to me. And but then like this, so um, these are the harassment that women are happening. And one thing I would like to stress is like every every uh, trust is related to financial status. And these not only women journalists but all the journalists are paid very and are paid uh, right now. Um, they, the, their salary alone cannot support their accommodation and that alone going to the clinic or education for their children. So this is another point that we have to stress, like these people are underpaid. That is very true. And I have my own data for that and as usual. So um, every trade is related to financial status. If these women journalists or these all journalists have a reliable financial assistance, then they will be able to like, um, stand up for the harassment. They have to be able to say no to certain situations. And so, and please don't, so for all the international donors out there, please don't only go to the media founders, media house owners or AI in chief, please go to the working journalists and please ask them, please talk to them of what's happening in the ground and then provide them with their uh, um, health assistance or education assistance and also financial assistance. Thank you for listening. Shu Nang, that was really um, helpful to hear. Um, I'm sure everyone appreciated um, learning more about those specific struggles and also um, advocating on um, what should be done to help improve that situation. So, so thank you. Um, I think, um, 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 yes, uh, maybe, does, I'm sorry, before we finish, um, I want to give a chance to see if any other of the panelists would like to just very briefly comment before just, we come to just, a close. Yes, just, please, Somia, please, please, please. I would like mm -hmm. to echo and support uh, what Sean has said. This is a, a serious uh, issue. Uh, there's challenges, uh, women, media personnel, women journalists on the ground uh, have to work. And uh, we need uh, to uh, uh, if there is any support, we need to increase the support, particularly for, for, for the women media workers and journalists. And uh, there is a, a Women Journalists Association, Myanmar Women Journalists Association, working with the women uh, in the, on the ground. And uh, Tinza Aung was here, I, I saw her. Uh, she's a representative of the uh, Myanmar Women Journalists Association. And we, I, we would, I would like to appeal international organization and supporters to extend an effective support to such uh, organization and women uh, journalists in Myanmar. Thank you, Somian, for adding those comments. And um, I, I think it's a, just a really wonderful, um, clear message to, to end what has been a, a great honor uh, to, to moderate. You made my job really easy uh, with such great panelists who have so much to say and so much insight with such experience. So, so thank you uh, for that. Um, and I would like to pass it back to Susan for some closing comments. Thank you. Uh, a huge mahalo to our distinguished panelists and our excellent moderator. Uh, honestly, every time I hear our Myanmar journalists speak, I am inspired. I thank you and all Myanmar journalists for their dedication, courage, and hard work to keep the world informed. And you know, I, I was thinking the East West Center held its 2014 International Media Conference in Yangon in 2014, a hopeful time when media was opening up and tasting freedom. Ethnic media had a safe space to speak at our conference in the presence of government officials who also attended our attended the event. So it makes me remember that the quick change in the media environment there reminds us that we can never take media freedom for granted anywhere in the world. We must protect it. So thank you again to our panelists and moderator. I'd like to ask our audience, please tune in to our next EWC Seminars Live, which will be the second week of May, when we will partner with the Korea Press Foundation on a panel of journalists and experts looking at the US-Korea relations 
on the 70th anniversary of the US-Korea alliance. So we will keep you updated. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next EWC Seminars Live. Aloha and mahalo.